Well, hello and welcome to the penultimate episode in this series looking at the coastline of Durham Tyne and Weir. Today I'm in the town of Hartlepool, which politically is often regarded as part of Teesside, but is very much a part of County Durham. I'm actually standing in the Hoff Battery Museum and the people here have very kindly allowed me to bring the camera in um, and the importance of this place will become apparent later in the programme. The name Hartlepool comes from two Anglo-Saxon words, Hort referring to a stag which has been seen or observed and the pool refers to a sheltered bay which was where these stags or deer were seen drinking. So Hartley Pool is a place where the deer drink. In the writings of the Venerable Bede in 750 AD it's referred to as Hirtu. Um, the Scandinavians referred to it as Hiatapal, uh, and it was the Norman influence that added the Lee bit in the middle. Similar French um, influence was afforded to the likes of Chesterley Street and Hettenley Hall, for example. Both of those are in the um, more northern area of the county of Durham. Today, Hartlepool has grown into a large, sprawling industrial town, but the original settlement was actually here on this particular headland and sometimes referred to as Old Hartlepool. The headland once again consists of magnesian limestone as we've seen throughout this series all the way down the coast from the very beginning at Seaton Sluice and uh, more or less finishes here at um, Hartlepool. Very early records suggest that this headland may have become a tidal island at high tide. Due to the marshy area flooding um, just to the north of here. Surrounding this low marshy area was a heavily forested area where the deer lived. Um, and those same deer that gave rise to Hartlepool's name. Excavations in the area have revealed tree trunks and deer antlers and deer teeth supporting this. The forest was still in existence at least until the 13th century. If we jump back for a moment to the retreat of the ice from the last ice age, a land bridge existed here between the east coast of Britain and the continent of Europe. Once the ice had fully melted and retreated to where it is today surrounding the North Pole, the melting ice raised the level of the sea and submerged this land bridge. Um, the headland here was at the northern edge of that land bridge when it existed. And of course, without me having to say, that melting water is what formed the, 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 the flooded basin, is what formed the North Sea we have today. So what makes this so significant is that this strip of land that connected um, the island of Britain to the main, um, mainland of, of Europe um, was that it allowed those early Mesolithic people to cross over and uh, to, to 
exactly where I'm standing now and then migrate north um, to inhabit Northumberland, the eastern part of Scotland and west to Cumbria. Being another strategic headland at the mouth of a river, this time the River Tees, the Romans would have certainly had some sort of structure here, at the very least a signal tower. We know there was a large settlement in the southern area of the town to the west of Seton Carew with links to a nearby Roman military outpost. There was also a Roman port here, though I'm not sure how big it was. Any of you Roman experts out there, please add a comment below if you know more on that particular aspect. The first abbess here was an Irish princess called Beggar. My research had her named as Hugh, but it is reportedly the same person. She was the daughter of an Irish king who sought peace with the King of Norway after the Scandinavians had threatened to invade. He betrothed his daughter to the Norwegian king's son in order to achieve this. Although very beautiful, having many suitors, Beggar had vowed to remain a virgin and sought a monastic life. During the drunken party preceding her arranged wedding, she escaped and fled to England, landing in St Bees in Cumbria, where she lived in solitude for several years. When St Bees became lawless and a hideaway for pirates, she moved to Northumbria, where she met St Aidan of Lindisfarne. It was Aidan that brought her here to Hartlepool and established a monastery here in 640 AD, which beggar was the abbess. St Hild of Whitby succeeded Beggar ten years later. If you recall from earlier episodes in this series and indeed earlier series that I've produced, you will remember that the monks of this early period of Christianity established monasteries all along this eastern coast of northern England. Regular traffic travelled between Whitby and Lindisfarne by sea. That was the only safe way to travel in at that time and the most efficient way to travel. Monasteries were dotted all down this coast, providing safe ports of call. Around the monastery grew a small fishing town, which operated successfully for several centuries. Around 875 AD, of course, the Danes raided the coast and they raided Hartlepool along with all the other places that we already know about. They destroyed the monastery and much of the town. They returned more than once after that, but with the intention of settling here rather than um, destroying the place. A very interesting building sits on the headland and it's the remains of the old manor house built in 1600 for the Lord of the Manor. And that was back in the feudal era of Hartlepool's history. It was built on the site of one of the monastery outer buildings and for a while it served as the hospital of St Hild for a time. That was probably also a leper hospital but that again that is my guess 
if anyone uh, has the exact uh, purpose of the hospital then again please add it in the comments below. After William the Conqueror took the throne of England as we've seen in past programs he rewarded his generals with riches and lands. The land surrounding Hartlepool um, called Hartness at the time was given to the de Bruce family in and and that was actually in 1153 AD. Robert de Bruce the first Lord of Annandale as his title was also became the Lord of Hartness. He instigated the building of the defensive walls around the town and that was because under their tenure they were constantly at odds with the Bishop of Durham as to who actually owned the land here. So you can see what happened here um, prior to William the Conqueror taking England all of this land right up into the borders of Scotland uh, was under the control of the bishops of Durham, connected to the monasteries of course, and as we know they held great wealth and great power. So William the Conqueror comes in, takes over England and decides to give this land to Robert de Bruce. Robert de Bruce of course was the grandfather of the Robert the Bruce King of Scotland who defeated the English at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. When Robert was crowned King of Scotland in 1306 the King of England who was Edward I decided to confiscate Hartlepool and strengthen the walls he anticipated a war with the Scots. Edward couldn't possibly allow a Scottish nobleman to own such a strategic um, point on the north coast of England because this would obviously pose a threat to York which was uh, the seat of significant power in the north of England. In 1315 Robert the Bruce raided Northern England and ransacked Hartlepool as he made his way south, taking revenge for the fact that Edward had confiscated this land from him. Hartlepool was also where the king fled after his defeat at Bannockburn. The magnificent church now standing where the monastery once stood was erected as the burial place for the Bruce family during that Norman period. Throughout the Middle Ages the port of Hartlepool grew to a point where it monopolised the shipping of Durham and the east coast. The late 1400s saw the first pier built here to help facilitate the port's growing trade. Throughout the ages Hartlepool's military significance played a key role in its history. During Elizabethan times the port was put on high alert with the fear that Mary Queen of Scots might land here uh, with an invading army. Again the significance of Hartlepool was that it was close to York and an easy place to land ships. Eight years later in 1569 Thomas Percy and Charles Neville gathered an army to oppose Elizabeth's rule and managed to capture the city of Durham. The Spanish ambassador instructed them to march on and capture Hartlepool so he could land an invasion force there to support them. The Earl of Sussex acting on behalf of his queen 
ordered an army of 200 men north to protect Hartlepool and stop them. His orders were ignored and Charles Neville was able to capture Hartlepool. As the rebels tried to take more towns in Durham, they found their support dwindling as south of Durham showed strong support for the Queen. The Spanish support never materialised and in December of 1569 a Royal Naval ship sailed north and pounded Hartlepool from the sea. Quickly Neville and Percy realised the failure of the rebellion and retreated into Scotland. During the English Civil War of 1642 to 1651, Hartlepool was again in the midst of the action. As I pointed out in episode 4, Alexander Leslie managed to capture the fort in South Shields um, in 1644 and as the Royalists retreated south towards York they were pursued here to Hartlepool. Leslie continued south in his pursuit of the Royalists and took Hartlepool later that same year. Hartlepool was occupied by Scottish forces throughout the remainder of the Civil War. After that period of turmoil passed, Britain was again at war, this time with Napoleon, and Hartlepool was once more in the front line. There was an urgent need to build a strong fleet of ships, and England's oak trees were being cut down at an alarming rate. The British Navy at that time had developed the Leader class frigate, a light manoeuvrable ship that could sail quickly to wherever it was needed anywhere in the Commonwealth. The ship moored here in the docks in Hartlepool is called the Trincomalee and is the oldest Napoleonic warship still afloat. Nelson's ship, the Victory, is 52 years older, but housed in a dry dock in Portsmouth. Hartlepool was chosen as the home for the Trincomalee because of the town's naval history and excellence in the restoration of past ships, namely the first Victorian ironclad battleship HMS Warrior, again on display at Portsmouth. The Trincomalee arrived here in 1987 and three years later opened to the public. The next major event to shape Hartlepool came just after the Napoleonic Wars when the local board of trade decided Hartlepool needed to reinvent itself. Hartlepool at this time was still a fishing and market town with a population of around 900. With new coal deposits being discovered under the county of Durham, and the new invention of the railway, the Board of Trade wanted to exploit these two new industries. Hartlepool would need a new harbour to handle exports of coal and the steel which would follow. They invited Isambard Kingdom Brunel to Hartlepool for ideas. The plans faced fierce local um, opposition and competition. To the north the Marquis of Londonderry had just opened the harbour at Seam in 1831 and we heard in the previous episode what a tyrant he was. 
To the south, the Clarence Railway Company was already running coal from Stockton and Billingham to a new port uh, called Port Clarence. Further south again, a railway between Stockton and Darlington was carrying coal to a new port at Middlesbrough. The plans, however, did get the go-ahead and the Hartlepool Dock and Railway Company was established in 1833, headed by a Christopher Tennant. The Clarence Rail Company ran into financial difficulty early on, and so the Hartlepool Company was able to take over and expand into Durham, forming the Hartlepool and Stockton Railway. In 1839, Tennant died, and a solicitor, Ralph Ward Jackson, took over. He was frustrated at the red tape faced during planning applications around the Old Harbour. So he bought up the land to the southwest, which at that time was a stretch of sand dunes. He developed that land into the West Hartlepool docks, dwarfing the original docks. It was also the beginning of the area of the town called Jackson Town, and today known as West Hartlepool. It hosts the majority of the town's industry today. The industry on the headland didn't die immediately though. One industry that survived and was able to take advantage of the new docks was the Hartlepool Magnesia Works. They set out to supply lime and building stone to the building industry. And um, a new development in steel production in the mid 1700s saw the need for dolomite to line the new hotter burning furnaces. Dolomite forms in the same way as magnesium limestone does, at the bottom of salt lakes or shallow seas. Dolomite has a slightly different chemical composition, having more calcium in it, but often occurs adjacent to limestone. The Hartlepool Magnesia Company was able to quarry dolomite here and by 1918 were producing 100,000 tonnes per year. William Gray was born in Blythe in Northumberland in 1823, the son of a draper. After his education in Newcastle, he spent time in London before coming to settle in Hartlepool. He established two shops, one on the headland and the other in the new part of the town. People came from far and wide to buy his clothes, bought from the London fashion houses. He became the town's mayor and eventually the High Sheriff of Durham. He was interested in shipbuilding and went into partnership with John Denton, forming the Denton, Gray and Company Shipbuilders. They specialised in iron ships built to a very high standard which earned them worldwide recognition. When Denton died, William renamed the company the William Gray and Company and went on to become the biggest producer of clipper barks and steamships in England. Before his death, Gray became the president of the Chamber for UK Shipping. One of Gray's paddle steamers has been preserved at the Museum of Hartlepool and is docked alongside the Trincomalee. During the period of threat from the Napoleonic era, 
A battery was constructed on the headland in the, exactly where I'm standing right now and it's called the Hoff battery. Remember a Hoff is a rocky cliff or headland. The battery was reinforced at the outset of World War I and with good fortune. Because of Hartlepool's importance as a growing successful port, it drew the attention of the Germans in 1914. Hartlepool was now building ships, producing steel and building engines. So once again at the heart of the British war effort. Before I start describing the morning of the 16th of December 1914, um, I just want to point out that in the background there, the cannon you can see at the far end of this um, particular shot was the Napoleonic gun. And the gun that you can see behind me was the one that was installed in the First World War and the one which was engaged in the uh, event that I'm going to describe to you now. So on the morning of the 16th of December 1914, three German ships, the Blucher, the Seditz and the Molk, took up positions two and a half miles off the coast here and began bombarding the town, killing 127 people and injuring over 400. Now, the battery uh, and uh, uh, members of the uh, armed forces that were stationed here were warned the night before to um, be vigilant and b it, because they'd had a tip off that these uh, ships were going to target Hartlepool. But on that morning it was foggy and although there were ships seen on the horizon there was some confusion initially of whether they were um, British ships or German ships. Of course as soon as the German ships opened fire it was obvious that they were the enemy. What had led to this attack was an embarrassing defeat for the German Navy in the South Atlantic some weeks before. And the Germans needed a quick revenge to boost morale. The battery on the Hof and another positioned in the, uh, the lighthouse you can see there just behind me, did their best to defend the town. This gun behind me managed to hit the Blucher but was un unable to stop the other two ships in their barrage of the town. A submarine had been sunk trying to leave the harbour to, in the, um, to assist in the fight but the fact that it was sunk, it was now blocking the harbour entrance. Two naval ships were trapped behind and therefore unable to help. The attack only lasted 40 minutes, but in that time the German boats had inflicted catastrophic destruction on the town. It was the only event during the First World War that involved a ship-to-shore exchange, but it prompted heavy reinforcements of similar batteries along the entire east coast. As I said, where I'm standing today is the Hof Battery Museum. And um, after the wars, um, it was put into a charitable trust um, about 10 years ago and open to the public. Some of the exhibits here have been collected over the years by the, um, I think it's a group of RAF guys who uh, set it up. Um, apparently the council wanted to make it into a car park, but they um, objected to that and established this war museum. 
and uh, from the gate you don't realize how much is here but many many exhibits inside the museum itself on the history of uh, the the significance of the warfare and and why this headland at Hartlepool was so important to defend um, it's a great place to visit free parking an excellent cafe toilets um, a great place to come for the day um, and uh, to spend your time and your money so um, as I say great place to visit and I'm extremely grateful for them allowing me in to do this film and bring this presentation to you anyway moving on between the wars Hartlepool suffered yet another major disaster when a local timber yard went on fire. The cause was never established but thought to be the fault of some faulty electrical cables. Strong winter winds fanned the flames causing utter devastation. The smoke could be seen all across the county and a fund was set up to help those whose homes were destroyed. King George V sent £150 to the fund. Doesn't seem like much for a king, but back then, of course, it was worth a lot of money. Hartlepool suffered again in 1930, this time during the Great Depression, with high unemployment and poverty. However, the onset of World War II brought a renaissance to the area with the need for ships and steel. Hartlepool, of course, was an expert in both of those. Foreign conflict saw Hartlepool rise to the limelight once more and that prosperity lasted another 20 years. The last ship to be built at Hartlepool was called the Blanchland and that um, was launched in 1961. Ten years later the steel industry was gone and the beginnings of a decline hit Hartlepool. Some new developments tried to alter the focus here away from the heavy industries of the past. In 1993 the docks were redeveloped to create the marina and the Royal Naval Museum. Nuclear power then came to nearby Billingham providing employment there. But so too did modern retail outlets and slowly Hartlepool morphed into what you see today. I couldn't possibly visit Hartlepool and not mention one of its famous residents, Reg Smythe. Some of you who um, maybe bought the tabloids of the day might recognise the name. But Reg Smythe in 1957 got a job as a cartoonist with the Daily Mirror. He invented a character he called Andy Cap, who was based on a typical working class man from the northeast. Smythe used his own observations to create the stories. The cartoon strip became so popular they were turned into books and West End plays before featuring as a short series on ITV in 1988. Andy Cap is the classic anti-hero. An idler never seen without his trademark cloth cap and cigarette end hanging from his bottom lip whose home life consisted of endless cups of tea, TV and kipping on the sofa, and whose outdoor life comprises drinking endless ale at the pub, visits to the betting shop, 
dodging the debt collector and the odd game of football. Cap is also a terrible chauvinist. His wife Flo being perpetually frustrated by her negligent hubby, although she does occasionally get the last laugh. Flo's trademarks are her slippers, rolling pin used mostly as a weapon and her rolled hair. This statue was unveiled by Reg Smythe's wife in 2007, sculpted by the artist Jane Robbins. Some notable landmarks here if you come to visit are the beach to the north and the breakwater built in 1853. The Church of St Hild on the headland is also a must-see with its magnificent architecture. In the new side of the town, William Gray's dock offices and the Customs House in Victoria Terrace have been finely preserved. Close to the railway station is Christ Church, built in 1854 by the Victorian architect Edward Lamb. It is no longer used for worship and became the town art gallery in 1996. Outside is the statue of William Gray facing the council buildings he once presided in as mayor. The statue of Ralph Ward Jackson stands at the opposite side of the church facing east along Church Street. Church Street still has some of the early historical buildings of the town uh, in existence. The old co-op building built in the 1950s still stands proud amongst a raft of new developments on the corner of Park Road. Finally, Wesley Square, Raby Road and Swainson Street are home to three classic buildings. The Methodist Church with its Corinthian style columns giving it almost a cathedral-like appearance. The old Hartlepool Town Hall, now a theatre, and the Grand Hotel built in 1899. Hartlepool has had the good fortune to host the tall ships on more than one occasion. The first time in 2010 and the second time last year in 2023. The succession of inner harbours here provides the perfect moorings for these magnificent ships. Hartlepool today is a vast sprawling town with many attractions old and new. I've pointed to just a few, so with that I will let you see it all from above and I will see you all in a few moments.
So there you have the drone and aerial views of Hartlepool. In the next episode, we arrive at our last location in this series, Seton Carew, which is a perfect place to conclude this series, as you will see. Until then, if you've enjoyed this episode, give it a like subscribe if you haven't already done so and don't forget to share the um, links to the channel and support the channel in whatever way you can so until i see you in the next episode i wish you the very best of health and uh, it's goodbye for now